Okay, I think uh, we'll uh, start off today's webinar. So first of all, welcome to all of you. Welcome to my fellow panelists who have so kindly agreed to join us in today's discussion. Uh, my name is Vipul Jain, and I'll be the host and moderator for today's uh, session. To briefly introduce myself, by training and education and profession, I'm a tech entrepreneur. Uh, but in 2002, uh, my wife, Shibani, Bharti Das Gupta, and myself, the three of us founded Catalyst for Social Action. And our the question that we had in our mind when we founded DSA was really to say that what can we do to help children whose families are unable to take care of them? We all understand the importance of family. If I was to ask you what is the single most important thing in your life, I'm sure the answer for each and every one of us, of us would be family. So when we think about those children, whose families are unable to take it, then really, I think somewhere our heart goes out to them and says, what can we do to help? Uh, CSA, over the years, we have worked in a number of areas. We have worked towards adoption, promoting and adoption and facilitating uh, both parents as well as adoption agencies. Uh, we, have, we are doing a lot of work around childcare institutions working with existing childcare institutions to improve their, the way they take care of children, health, hygiene, security, protection, all of that. Most importantly, education, life skills, preparing them for the future. And then we had an aftercare program, which is to take care of them when they turn 18 and need to be independent and look for a job and a career. Right. Our vision at CSC is to see that every child in need of care and protection is nurtured into a happy and independent adult and a contributing member of society. We are currently working with about 90 states uh, in four states, Maharashtra, Goa, Madhya Pradesh, and Orissa, and <clears throat> about 300 aftercare children uh, so that's a little bit about CSA. Uh, today, let me <clears throat> let me introduce my fellow panelists. I'm really, really delighted to have uh, uh, Ms. Shanta Sinha, probably one of uh, the leading child rights activists in India. She had founded MV Foundation. And they started off with the mission of uh, preventing children who are going into child labor and getting them into education. It's an amazing work that has been done uh, over many years, and I'm sure you will hear a lot more about it in this webinar. She headed the National Commission for Protection of Child Rights as its first chairperson for two consecutive terms. She also served as a professor of political science in the University of Hyderabad. She's the recipient of Raymond uh, Magase Award in 2003 and the Padam Shri in 1998. A big welcome to you, you. Antaji, and really thank you for joining us in this panel. I will now come to uh, Chitrakala Acharya. Chitra is, uh, she had services in Childline India Foundation. Childline, as you know, has been appointed by the government to be the nodal agency for the Childline Network. And the Childline Network is the first point of call for any, any child in distress, right? And it's a <clears throat> wide network. It's a very unique partnership, private public partnership that Childline and uh, the Ministry of uh, WCD have actually created and a wonderful resource for children in need of care and protection. Chitraji has been working with Childline for a very long time and heads up services. Uh, we also have uh, Ms. Manisha Biraris. She is the Assistant Commissioner 
WCD and the program manager for the ICPS department in Maharashtra. She joined the Maharashtra Public Services Commission exam, was posted to the education department, moved to the WCD since 2012 <coughs> and has been looking after uh, the whole ICDS and the ICPS programs of the state. And then I'd like to welcome uh, Nivedita Dasgupta. She is the India country head for Miracle Foundation. Uh, Nivedita holds a master's degree from Tata Institute of Social Work, over 30 years of experience in the social development sector. And of course, she is the head of uh, the country head of Miracle Foundation, which have been doing some really amazing work while working with child care institutions across the country. And I'm sure she will share a lot more with you about what her experience and Miracle's uh, body of work has been. And last but not least, we have got Anandi uh, Yagnaraman. Uh, she has been in the education and nonprofit sector for 17 years. She has a master's in uh, educational leadership and management from the University of London, has completed her executive education program from Harvard Business School. Uh, she was working with the uh, Akansha Foundation for many, many years and is currently the CEO of Catalyst for Social Action. So a warm welcome to all of you in the panel once again. Uh, so what are we going to be talking about? We're going to be talking about children in need of care and protection. So what does that really mean, right? It means <clears throat> homeless, runaways, lost children, orphans, or whose parents have relinquished their, child, their children, children who are at risk of abuse or exploitation, or engaged in child labor, who are living with a parent who is unfit or incapable of taking care of the child. So in short, a child whose parents are either not there or are unable to take care of the child. That's what is meant by children in need of care and protection. Now, as we all know, uh, India is a signatory to uh, many UN conventions around child rights. So every child is entitled to the right of protection, of right against exploitation, right to survival, which covers health, hygiene, right to development, to proper education, to participation in society, to equality, and so many other rights. Okay, so really the question is, how are we as a society, and I'm saying the government, the society, all of us are part of it. How are we going to take care of our children in need of care and protection? The pandemic is, as we all know, not only a health crisis, but a crisis uh, in economic terms, in social terms, right? And as we all know, uh, it's, you know, it's already been three and a half months, four months that we have seen the brunt of it. We don't know when it's going to end. The chances are that it will continue and the impact of this may be much more long lasting than we think. So really in today's discussion, we are going to say, how is the COVID-19 crisis impacting vulnerable children and our ability to take care of them. So I'm going to start by uh, turning to Shantaji and asking her to share uh, briefly her perspective around this. How does she see vulnerable children and the way we take care of them pre-COVID and of course impact due to COVID? Shantaji. Um, thank, you, thank you very much to the Catalyst for Change too. Uh, inviting me to be on this panel and uh, I, I will be as uh, brief as uh, I can because this is a topic on which one can talk for uh, 
minutes, hours, and for days together. And some of us who are here on this panel, I know how obsessed you are with children and their rights. And you must be breathing children, dreaming children, and the sheer madness about children. And sometimes I wish the entire country thinks children the way all of us are thinking children in such an obsessive manner, you know, and uh, I think that is what is lacking in the country, that we are not obsessed about children and their rights. We are not mad about children. We, we are not even thinking children. And that has been before COVID and that has been even, I suppose, after COVID. But you, there are bright sparks here and there, even among the audience. There must be so many bright sparks who are like you and me, mad uh, about children. And I'm happy to be in this uh, audience uh, who are thinking children. Now, what happened before COVID has got so much to do with what is happening after COVID for children. You know, if a system does not work in normal times, it is difficult for the system to gear up in extraordinary and emergency times. Let me tell you, I mean, I'm not negative about the system. I might add a rider. There are some very good uh, officials. There are like uh, Chitrakala here who are very dedicated uh, persons who are working within the system. But that is mostly a response as an individual, but it would not seem as a systemic response to the plight of children. You know, just because there are some very dedicated and committed people at every level in the system does not make the system correct for children. And here we are talking about systemic challenges. And I think there were huge systemic challenges even before COVID times for children in need of care and protection. And we will have to just ask uh, two fundamental questions. Is it fair for children to be in need of care and protection? Is it fair for children to be uh, uh, exploited? Is it fair for children to be challenged for their survival, for their development, for their protection? Is it fair for children to have abu an abusive family? Because we know family is such a uh, well-evolved uh, 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 institution and a system. All of us have gained from the family as an evolved institution and system. Is it fair for a child uh, to be in that kind of a circumstance? Does a child have a choice in where he or she is being born? Has a child a choice in being born to a poor family, to a marginalized family? So if there are these disadvantages where a child has no choice in being where he is located or she is located in the society, then there is a huge role for the system and for the society as well. You know, because they don't choose where they are to be born. They don't choose the community. They don't choose the caste. They don't choose the family. They are just there. And if that is a great disadvantage, then there is a huge role for all of us. And that is what I think uh, we are talking about when we are talking about children in need of care and protection. And this huge role for the family, I mean, for the society is not just not enough. There is a huge role for the state. And that is what has been so well elaborated in the Juvenile Justice Act. And you can, except for one or two portions of the act, I think one has seen the 2015 Juvenile Justice Act is, is a very well drafted act. It is exactly what we want to say has been put in that uh, document. We just have to implement it and implement all the systems that they have thought about for children in need of care and protection. Institutional care, foster care, sponsorship, uh, child welfare committees, child line, DCPU. In fact, you, you, every system that we've asked for is already there. But what is lacking is this question that are we all concerned about children in terms of their fairness and in terms of justice for children. If we put it in the framework of is it just, is it fair for children, then I think answers to that will come. In the COVID times, we have heard about many, many children uh, uh, getting out of, uh, who are in school joining the labor force, out of school, of course, uh, it gets reinforced. We've heard of abuse in the family. We've observed, uh, observed uh, I mean, uh, heard of increase in child marriages. We've heard of uh, 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 food insecurity, 
we've heard of anxiety, we've heard of uncertainty, and we've heard of everything that should not be happening to a child in a marginalized family. They're very, very vulnerable. And just one more thing I must add to those who are organizing child care institutions. And we, we also ran a bridge course camp for children. And all of a sudden, in the beginning, in March 26, 27, we were told you have to just close down your institution. Where would we send our children? You just close down and they are here with you because they have nowhere to go, you know, in a way. And we had to trace their families and send them back. Many children didn't want to go back, but then that was a, a kind of a rule that was imposed on us. So we secretly kept the children and didn't report to the government that we are keeping the children with us. You know, I think this must have happened to so many of us as all of a sudden. So that showed the stark vulnerability of children. Somewhere the child care institutions that we are running have, in fact, we gain from them and we also, they gain from us and we, we had such a bonding with one another and it is such a, all of a sudden a disruption saying that, look, you don't belong to us. We don't belong to you. You go back from where you've come from. I don't care. That I thought was, uh, the, that moment, in fact, it uh, gave us an idea of the kind of vulnerability these children face. You know, suddenly they're left without anything. And we had to keep them in as if they were in illegal custody with us. You know, which was, and of course, later on, we had a very well uh, uh, Supreme Court order, and I'm sure all of you know, uh, which had given guidelines which were contrary to what the government had asked. I will not go into the future, but just to tell you that how vulnerable these children have been who are with us, how precarious their existence is, that by one stroke, you could, in fact, make them even more vulnerable. Uh, and it is these kinds of children that we are discussing today. And I'm glad that you've asked and they cannot be vulnerable. They must not be vulnerable and they must know that we are all there for them. And they are also for us. They, they brought out the best in us. We owe it to them just as I suppose they, they have our care and protection. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, can we, can I ask Chitra to talk a little about child line and what you are actually seeing in child line over the past few months you need to unmute yourself chitra yeah firstly i would like to thank uh, catalyst for social change for this great opportunity because I see it as an opportunity to represent the work of the entire Childline Network, uh, which has been uh, at it from the time the COVID has, the pandemic has struck. And uh, as uh, we all know, it's the India's first uh, helpline, telehelpline uh, outreach uh, service for children in distress. And as on date, we have uh, Childline services operational in 573 districts, which is about roughly about 78% of the country covered. And uh, also uh, emergency services provided through help desks at uh, 129 railway stations across the country. So that's the present coverage uh, as on date. And uh, I would like to really thank, um, as it's a public-private partnership, I must place a record that uh, it's been a very engaging, very enriching partnership with the Government of India, the Union Ministry for Women and Child Development, and also partnerships with various stakeholders right from the district level, the district administration to the state governments, uh, which we have seen uh, through this journey of child life. So that's, that's something I would like to begin with. And uh, I see it as an opportunity to share the work that's being done. Uh, I have a few slides on uh, the kind of um, interventions and calls that have come in uh, during this the last uh, three months. And so since uh, the pandemic has struck, Satyajit, can you move to the next one? So uh, if we can see, uh, it's more than 15 lakh calls have been received uh, by Childline uh, from March 20th to 30th uh, June, and uh, of this, 
the north has accounted for the largest percentage of uh, calls uh, and interventions both followed by west east uh, and south can you go to the next and uh, over a lakh intervention direct intervention with children that has been carried out in this period strategy can we go to the next slide so if we look at uh, the the break up of the calls uh, more than two thirds it's about 66.4% uh, of the calls that have intervention that have been carried out has been related to covid which includes relief supplies uh, to uh, the necessary to the needy uh, the most marginalized uh, communities families individuals and this has been followed by uh, calls uh, and interventions for poor protection concerns which is the protection of abuse which accounts for about 18 uh, percent and uh, thereafter then the rest of the calls have followed which includes uh, emotional support and guidance uh, children who have been reported lost restoration of children who have been uh, away from families medical assistance so if we look at uh, the break up uh, deep dive into the break up of uh, the poor protection uh, concerns related cases the highest number of interventions have been uh, per child marriage which uh, actually came uh, you know it quite a, a stark uh, representation uh, followed by physical abuse emotional abuse uh, child labor Agree. So th this this actually is uh, is a reflection of despite the pandemic having struck and uh, people uh, not having access to you know phones or to make uh, to services, uh, the calls that have been received in Thailand reflect that child protection violations have uh, you know continued to be uh, visible to be prevailing in this. Situation. Can you go to the next? So, uh, looking at interventions, we were trying to map, and uh, as we saw, North accounts for the highest number of calls as well as interventions. The top five states are uh, Uttar Pradesh, followed by Madhya Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, and uh, Karnataka. Can we move to the next? Uh, so far as strategy, yes, this one. If we look at the COVID interventions, also it has been UP, Madhya Pradesh, uh, Punjab, Maharashtra, and last one being Rajasthan. Next, uh, ma'am, we have only this is the last slide that you sent us in the document. So this has been uh, this has been uh, more or less, you know, a representation of the kind of calls. Uh, intervention is done i would like to uh, also add that uh, we have seen uh, interventions which uh, have been carried out through the period uh, when you look at the kind of impact that uh, the theme of today's webinar being the impact on uh, uh, child protection and care so uh, what we see is also that children have been so in various areas they have been impacted there has been uh, neglect uh, and due to medical care not being available covid treatment has been has taken precedence over other minor ailments so uh, there has been uh, to an extent you know uh, children or people who visit the hospitals have not been able to really get that kind of attention that they would like to have uh, in in a normal situation the the other impacts uh, definitely is for children who been they have uh, also been uh, subject to physical abuse victim children have been victims of uh, violence and also been uh, witness to domestic violence often resulting in children who have been forced to leave home uh, there have been instances of elopement children getting reported as missing so these are uh, kind of issues which have really uh, the the movement 
of children. Similarly, uh, sexual abuse, when we talk of sexual abuse, Caroline has also received cases where there has been instances of sexual assault within the family by a biological father, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, with, uh, with resistance from the mother, sometimes not. So uh, these, uh, while they have been within the four walls, they have, there has been tremendous insecurity uh, and threat to their own uh, well-being. We also have instances of uh, stalking, mol molestation, uh, children also who are in the care of their families, for instance, women care that there have been instances of children being kidnapped while they have been uh, living in the pavement. Similarly, uh, instances of uh, cases of online abuse, uh, leading uh, online abuse, which could be uh, morphing of pictures, uh, threats to uh, make uh, pictures viral, Chitra. online abuse leading to offline acts and also resulting in uh, uh, getting victimized uh, for sexual assault. Children engaged in uh, uh, Sorry to interrupt you. The voice is not, the audio is not very clear. Uh, okay. Can you, can is it better now? It's better now. Yes, please. Okay. So I, I'll just recap what I quickly said if it has not been. So it includes physical and mental health being affected, vulnerability of children while uh, at home and uh, even from the neighborhood, being forced into exploitative situations such as uh, begging, um, trafficking for say for uh, sexual exploitation, also abandonment of differently able children. This has been really very um, it's unfortunate, but we've had children being abandoned at the railway stations uh, while they are traveling. A simple example of a child uh, traveling with the family, a differently able child asked to get to get off the train and get water, and the train moved. So uh, this, this is quite indicative of uh, abandonment uh, of children at railway stations and also in uh, community uh, in general. So uh, these are some of the varied uh, kind of uh, vulnerabilities that children have been encountering in the COVID pandemic. Yeah? Thank you. Wow. I think just hearing that and the scale of the problem, it really makes us feel, you know, very humble and how much work we have to do. Uh, can I move on to uh, uh, Manisha Berares and uh, ask her to think about, to share with us how the government is thinking about this and how are, what are their expectations from, uh, you know, the other from all of us. Thank you, Vipulji. Mm -hmm. Also, I have uh, CSA uh, to call me here. Actually, uh, when pandemic start, we face uh, problems on two levels. First level is our CCI level, and second one is uh, on ground also. Because many of parents wanted uh, children back as pandemic starts and we need to send that back uh, near about. Uh, before the uh, pandemic, we are having uh, 21,521 uh, children in all CCIs. We are having 450 CCIs in Maharashtra, registered CCIs in Maharashtra. And uh, as the COVID situation started, near about seven, uh, 1,078, uh, 10,785 children are sent back as parents wanted uh, to take them with them uh, with themselves. Also, we have to take care of the, our in chief uh, care, Pal Sangopal uh, children also. They are 12,961 last year. Mm. As uh, this situation started, we firstly uh, take care of uh, our CCI children and for that we started uh, firstly stop the entries uh, from outside, uh, visitors and all the peoples because uh, we need to stop the uh, spread. 
After that, we uh, started taking care of uh, children. We provided them uh, masks and uh, sanitizer, soap, and all the things. After that, we uh, also uh, uh, deputed six divisional nodal officers on uh, for uh, on state level to take daily connection with the CCIs also and uh, with the children uh, in Balsangupan Yojana also. We communicated with them with the help of uh, a video call or a telephone call and uh, online counseling services and various other activities such as rapport building, mind uh, healing, positive sharing and anger management are conduct conducted with the help of uh, NGOs uh, organization like Save the Children, CSA, uh, UNICEF. In our uh, many of the homes, we are having uh, superintendents, counselors. They are also work very hard in this situation. Also, our CWCs in every uh, district, they are also uh, taken very uh, good initiatives to provide counseling services to children in CCI um, through available resources uh, during this period. Means they call uh, through WhatsApp call, uh, through Zoom meetings and uh, so many things. Also, the CWCs have also conducted uh, sessions for children residing in CCIs through video uh, calls. Well, uh, all uh, procedures in this period are on, online and uh, also we need to take care of the staff also and that's why we are taking uh, done now the restricted some things so uh, because uh, uh, we have to stop the spread from outside so we uh, many of our uh, cci has done that uh, uh, the uh, staff will uh, decide in the uh, home only and they were uh, in, for 15 days they were yeah, 8 to 15 days uh, however, uh, however, is the availability they were in the homes, and uh, after that, uh, uh, the next uh, staff will come. These uh, things we manage uh, in this period, and uh, from NGO, we need uh, we got so many support in this period. Means uh, there are uh, online session for online sessions, education, formal informal education. All uh, many of uh, the NGOs help us, but at the same time they also help us uh, to getting the, uh, the mask and uh, sanitizer, also IJM, uh, CSA, Save the Children. They uh, provided these all these things. Miracle Foundation is uh, working in our uh, many of homes also, and uh, we have started the uh, gatekeeping training also for this period also. So uh, henceforth also we are expecting the support from all the NGOs in formal and informal education, follow-up, sponsorship, psychological aspect. This is uh, one of the main uh, um, aspect where we, are, uh, we have to work now because children are in home from last three to four months and they are, they are uh, not in contact with the other people. And so we have to uh, work for psychological aspect very deeply. Aftercare is one of the aspects where we have to work uh, uh, more because uh, we are uh, having seven aftercare homes and there are near about uh, uh, 300 uh, children, uh, youths are there. But the uh, youths who are after, uh, out of the, these uh, homes, we need to take care of them also and we are uh, working on this also. And in this, I think uh, I'll get help from all of you. So uh, we are uh, wishing all the uh, good things from all of you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Manisha ji. And we will come back to this topic around how do we look after the children that are in childcare homes. We will come back to this topic. But for a moment, I still want to dwell on this larger issue. The larger issue is that there are close to 25 million children, which according to UNICEF in 2016 were orphans. There are close to 10 million children which are child laborers, right? And of course, you have seen the amazing statistics that uh, Childline has just reported, right? Uh, you know, 15 lakh calls in three months. Right? So, 
So there are very large number of children out there, right? And probably the one task that we need to think about is that how do we identify the vulnerable children and get them onto the inside the system, get them onto our radar, get them into some form of care by which uh, they can be uh, looked after, right? And how can we prevent children out there from uh, becoming more vulnerable, right? So I would like uh, to hear from you, Anandi. I think CSA had done some vulnerability mapping, right? Can you share some of that? Yeah. So CSA works with about 90 homes across Madhya Pradesh, Odisha, Maharashtra, and Goa. And we work with about 5,000 children. But clearly, when we talk about the numbers out there as Vipul mentioned, 25 million children are estimated to be vulnerable. Now, clearly, we need to work on getting attention to these children and guiding them and linking them to the support and services. So we recently did a project, and I believe that this can be one way, a possible way by which we could identify these children. So this project happened in Madhya Pradesh with the collaboration with the government. And we trained close to 8,000 Anganwadi workers on the ground. Now, the workers were trained in identifying CNCP children and also on educating them on child rights. We believe that this will be a way by which we can actually identify these children because Anganwadi workers and ASHA workers are the people who know what is happening in every family with every child in their area. So close to 8,000 Anganwadi workers were trained and then they were asked to go on do a door-to-door -door survey. So we got about 2,000 forms back after the way and we segregated those forms and looked for cases which uh, required immediate attention. And we found 370 cases which required immediate attention. We actually did the social investigation ourselves. Um, in fact, that brought about a lot of learning. We found that children were fostered by families who could have had access to some schemes and support from the government. Like children who were fostered could have had access to medical help. Uh, for example, we found one mentally challenged mother who needed medical help was unable to support her children. So through this scheme, while bringing this attention to the authorities, we actually moved the mother to a hospital for medical care and moved the children safely under institutional care. So uh, this project has brought in a lot of light about how we can, you know, if, if administered on a large scale, actually go door to door and identify children who need care and protection. Of course, we could only do 371. And, you know, there's many more social investigation reports to be done. And uh, unfortunately, the the PWC and the DCP units do not have the funds to make these investigations right now. Uh, but we actually believe training the frontline workers will be a huge help for us in identifying these vulnerable children. And we are close to documenting this project and uh, going to hand over this to the government. And we'd be very happy to be a knowledge partner in should this project be replicated and scaled. Because this, I think, is, was an eye-opener for us and how the Anganwadi and ASHA workers can play a very significant and instrumental role in identifying and bringing attention to these children. Thank you, Anandi. Can I turn to Nivedita? And Nivedita, the question that I have for you is this, right? Yes, you know, the scale of children in need of care and protection is huge, huge, right? We all know that. Unfortunately, there's no uh, detailed survey done where we can, uh, you know, do that. But we all know that the scale is huge. We know that uh, child care institution is one way of providing care and protection, at least on a temporary basis, till some other solution is found and maybe for some children on a long-term basis. And there are about 9,000 child care institutions across the country with about 390,000 children residing at them. Okay. So 
can you share what you feel about both? How do we bring in, identify more children out there, bring them into the system? And what do you think is the role of childcare institutions in that entire rehabilitation process? Thank you, Vipul, and thank you, CSA, for this opportunity, uh, for the benefit of uh, the participants and the other people. Just three slides to introduce Miracle Foundation India. Can you go to the next slide, Satyajit? So, you know, this is our mission, supporting orphans, vulnerable children to have a better quality of life while bringing sustainable changes that reduces the need for institutions. Our core initiatives so far have been prevent children from entering the system at the first place, ensure that every child thrives, and Miracle Foundation is part of a global network of nonprofit organizations leading the worldwide movement to end the need of institutions by 2040. Our impact so far has been that we have reached out and improved lives of 15,000 and plus children. Uh, you know, we are uh, training under a training plan. We are training more than 200 and uh, 2,300 government officials uh, in the child protection system. 20% of the children that we have worked are united with their families. And, you know, we, uh, on need basis, we continue to support them. 40% increase we see on our, uh, you know, trademark Thrive Skills course for children, with children where we directly support. And we have implemented the same thrive scale methodology to close to 300 childcare institutions. Go ahead, please, Satyajit. And this is just a map just to show how uh, we have spread, uh, you know, where our offices are and where our, um, when I say base model CCI is where we are directly working and elsewhere we are working through train the trainer or, you know, the other training modules which also reaches to the children. Thank you, Sanjit. So going back to your question, Vipul, you know, yes, you know, there are, uh, and I, you know, I really liked what um, um, uh, Chitrakala presented and uh, Anandi mentioned, you know, your survey uh, in Madhya Pradesh is really great. And we really look forward to reading more in detail about the report. But an assessment of the situation of the children as a result of this particular pandemic and otherwise, is so important that what could be done in short and long term. And this data needs to be made available to everybody. It's scattered, it's, you know, it's in bits and pieces. So, and many times on the um, state websites, it's not updated. So when you're looking for a data to see what exactly is available and where the children are, you're not able to get it in one place. And that's something, you know, um, government or, you are a catalyst for social change. You know, could you know, could come forward and get this data together. So that's something that you know one really would like to see to happen. Uh, the other, um, you know, I know that there are so many institutions. Uh, you know, lately, you know, the institutions, the number has come down. The need is still there, but we, there is also a shift to see how the children could be settled back in the families and support the family send them the family so that children are settled in the families. There are questions asked that, you know, what about the abuse and protection and other support that the family requires? But I think that there are various schemes and there are various uh, ways to take care of this, the way Miracle Foundation is going ahead and doing it with those children who have reunited with the families. Um, you know, un under our family five domain uh, for the family strengthening, uh, we, we uh, identify the needs of the children and support them to make sure that the family as a unit stays together and the child settles. Because we all know, uh, you know, we all in India, all uh, whatever is being done for the children is under the United Nations Convention of Rights of the Child. And family is the first right that the child has, wherever or however poor he is. So the need... I'm sorry, the need for the CCI just continue to stay, but we look at it as a temporary arrangement where uh, it is required uh, in case of emergency. But the minute the child enters a CCI, I think efforts to be done to make, have a proper social investigation report in place and an individual child care plan to be laid out and then make sure that in a, in, in a systematic time, the child is reunited with the family or look at other alternative care options which are there but not really considered important. And I think those need to be brought to the forefront right now 
to make sure that you know we are taking care of these vulnerable children all over. Otherwise, when you read reports like this, you know I want to just uh, it 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 pains me, and I am sure it has pained all of you that somewhere in a newspaper last week there is an article that because the midday meals were stopped, children are back to rack picking because there isn't anything, or they are begging. Or you know, you know, in many places there are reports of child marriages taking place. Uh, uh, you know, or you know, closure of schools. The children are turning to child labor. So these are some things which are disturbing, and I'm sure they are to all of you. And I'm just citing a few examples. But I think in the long run, whether children are in the families or for some reason temporarily they are in CCIs, I think such uh, you know. Uh, mechanism to provide care and protection really needs to be strengthened. It needs to be simplified and uh, the making the general public aware that such systems and such support could be given to the children. I often get mails, uh, you know, from vague places saying that this child is an emergency, this child is on the roads and I always guide, I always give them child line number and tell them that you should reach out to them. Uh, because not knowing how far I am from there, I cannot personally go there. But it, it tells me something that we really need to, um, you know, create an awareness of this in the general public to make sure that the children are cared for and protected. Thank you, Vipul. Yeah, I think the scale of the problem that we have in India is so huge. Right? The numbers are staggering. But certainly, uh, no one way is really going to be the solution, right? We'll have to work on multiple fronts. And of course, rehabilitation of the family is the preferred thing. But still, there will be many, many instances where that's not possible, either in the short run or even for the longer term. And therefore, there is a space for childcare institutions. You know, if we look at our capacity in the country of 390,000 children, right, in childcare institutions, to my mind, that probably represents about 2% of the children that could potentially be vulnerable, right? So I think certainly this type of capacity we will require. There are lots more children we are seeing through the, uh, you know, through all this evidence, whether it is the number of calls being received by child line or through the vulnerability mapping, that there are a lot more children out there who are not even identified. And yes, so you will see a lot more children who, if we do the job properly, you'll see a lot more children who are identified, will need to be put in childcare institutions, and then of course, try and rehabilitate it back with the family. So to me, you know, looking at the existing capacity of, chi of childcare institutions, which is just about two, three percent, to me, that's the minimum holding capacity we need in the system. And really now I'm going to turn the question to how can these childcare institutions provide better care? Okay, let's for a moment assume that we will need childcare institutions, but how can we do a better job in terms of looking after them and how can we see that the real rehabilitation outcome is brought about. So can I uh, ask uh, uh, Anandi to talk a little bit about uh, what, you know, what, what has been the experience in terms of improving uh, care in childcare institutions? So when the COVID crisis began, like everybody else, uh, we just started helping them out with uh, sanitation kits because first concern was the health and safety of our children. So we started giving them sanitation kits, hand wash, masks, and you know that later moved on to providing groceries and provisions, etc. But we on this wanted to understand a little bit deeper on how the CCIs are actually functioning during this period and what kind of support do they need. So we rolled out a quick survey. And of course, this is done with 78 of our partner childcare institutions. But I think what we see here can be fairly representative of others as well. So the first thing is 78% uh, of children have actually stayed 
home. They have stayed in the childcare institutions. And we actually did a survey again last week, and it is um, heartening to know that all of them are safe and there has been no incidence of any COVID for these children who have stayed indoors. Uh, as soon as the pandemic began, 82% of these homes were actually immediately contacted by the district authorities, asking them what kind of support, giving them guidelines how to maintain safety concerns during this time. So there was an immediate contact to 80%, 82% of the homes. But the fact is only 54% of these homes actually did not receive any support or any kind or financial support from the government. Now, I want to draw the attention to the last two aspects as well, that as Manisha Ma'am said as well, that only the homes which has the staff living inside and indoors with these kids have continued to operate and all the outsiders have not been allowed to come in for safety reasons. But that also meant that these CCIs were operating with 50% staff during this time. And all of them, almost 72% of them, have actually told us that they have funds just to survive the next six months. So this was done in May. So we're already talking in July. So funding is a huge crunch that all of these CCIs face. Of course, nonprofits like us, we support in many different ways. But I think one of the ways, or probably two ways, that we can actually change this for the CCI is one is build the capacity of the PPIs, ease the process. And the second part is to ensure that ICPS funds are steadily available for these institutions. Right now, it comes in tranches, sometimes all at once, sometimes doesn't come for a long time. If there is a regularized way by which they can receive the funds on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis, then I think CCIs will have the visibility on how to operate and can definitely do better at what they are doing today. So in my opinion, strengthening and funding are two big ways by which they can be enforced. Shantaji, would you like to add something to this discussion right now? You're mute. You'll have to unmute yourself. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, I, I think the issue of funding is so important. And uh, if you look at it, the budget is hardly 1,500 crores. And you're talking about 30 million children who are in need of care and protection. So it shows where the political will is, you know. And uh, I know it is cliche to say that it is political will that is lacking. But I think uh, funds are just not available. I can even say that funds are not available for the homes, not for available for CWC, not available for Sideline Foundation. They're doing remarkable work, but you talk to an NGO who's, who's managing the Sideline Foundation, they don't have money enough. And the disbursements that Sanandi talked about, you know, at least if it is predictable, if you knew it was coming, then you can have some strategy here. You don't know when you will get funds. It's so unpredictable how much you would get. I think these are the issues uh, which are very crucial. All other issues are not as important as I would think predictability of funds, flow of funds uh, and respecting each of the childcare institutions uh, uh, in a manner that the children will feel safe. It's insecurity of the institutions and an insecure institution is to provide secure to security to children. And I find that it's uh, just not on. How do we get the government to say that you will have to have a fund flow and children just can't wait? I, it is a huge question. And uh, how do we keep writing letters to the parliamentarians? Uh, you know, many of us kind of, uh, I would say, accommodate saying, at least this is there and let us go on. If we ask too many questions, perhaps even this is not going to be there. I don't think we should do that, you know, that I, I, I know how a Sideline Foundation uh, NGOs work. They never complain saying funds aren't coming. They don't do it in public. I know their salaries come six months after. How are they going to run? 
you know, it's it's not just that child welfare committee, the sitting fee is hardly 500 rupees. And if they have to do social investigations, as you say, you don't write about each child, they don't have the kind of staff that they have to do. So somewhere I think we will have to do a proper budgeting of what it means to run a decent sideline, a decent child care institution. Uh, you know, it's so important. And I don't know if that uh, budget, if uh, we, we pull, uh, if you have done what it needs to run a decent child care institution, what kind of budget is required and is that coming? Oh, it's a very valid question, Shantaji. And certainly, uh, I think, uh, you know, funds are absolutely one of the things required to run a child line institution. But what I've also seen is that most of the, of the institutions are not very large, right? 25, 30, 40, 50 children. And they're located not in the metro cities, but also in small, small Absolutely, cities. right. And they're started off by very well-meaning people. When you actually meet these trustees who started off these institutions, you really say, my God, you know, why? how did you start, right? And what right. is you doing? And therefore, what they also require is a lot of support in terms of knowledge, in terms of partnership, sure. in terms sure. of abilities, right, which on their own they don't have access to, right. Mm -hmm. So I think those are many of the things that they require. And around funds, you know, this whole ICPS scheme actually provides for 2,000 rupees per child. It also provides for certain expenditure towards the upgradation of an institution, infrastructure, staff, etc. Unfortunately, I, I think it's implemented in different states in different ways. And the, uh, certainly all the institutions don't get access to it for a variety of reasons. So I don't want to put Manisha ji on the spot, but I'd let me turn around the question and ask her, right? What do you, what do you do NGOs so that you will die? make that check happen every month. <laughs> what support? Yeah. Yes, sir. Hello. So around... Yeah, are you getting my... Yeah, what can be done to make it a very streamlined way for the government and for the child care institutions? Yeah, uh, thank you, Vipulji. But uh, as you know, as you said, I am very uh, little person to talk about this. Uh, but still, uh, from last uh, uh, three years, I am working here, and uh, we started to uh, streamline so many things for funds also. As uh, uh, central government, or uh, I am talking about, uh, firstly about uh, ICPS team, central government was also taking uh, PAB uh, was, uh, at uh, the end of, I think, October, November. But now they have started uh, doing it uh, in the month of April only. And uh, uh, they are taking budgets uh, from us uh, before the uh, year ending, uh, first year ending only. And uh, they are, uh, now they are giving us a monthly budget. Uh, till now they given us budget for uh, this uh, April, May and June. And now they are just waiting for uh, from us some documents and they will uh, provide us next three months uh, budget. There are some problems in uh, Maharashtra uh, PDS system and uh, we are taking uh, for it from last two years and uh, I think uh, uh, from this year that uh, all the problems will be solved. Yes, fund is not coming in time. This is a big problem, but uh, we are trying to uh, um, take over this also as soon as possible. And uh, I think from last three months, there is a, uh, because of no funds, um, there was not uh, any uh, problem uh, as per my knowledge. Uh, we provided for this pandemic as uh, we are aware that fund is a uh, little bit coming late. So we given JJ uh, from JJ fund amount uh, for emergency services to every district. And uh, that uh, that was very uh, great uh, help to all district and uh, for CCI. 
also we uh, distributed our bal sangopan yojana fund was uh, because of uh, uh, this pandemic in the month of march there was a uh, no bill passed uh, because of passed for bal sangopan yojana so we given uh, all the money uh, government given this all uh, provided this all money in the month of april and we given uh, this students all sponsorship uh, this kinship care uh, money also also we provided funds to this um, uh, child care institute for their uh, the last year uh, year remaining uh, budget also and we are uh, just uh, now giving this year budget also some of the problems for dcpu salary and ccia salary are there and we are going to solve this uh, as soon as possible when in between this period we are uh, expecting from uh, ngos to only just uh, to help for cci not for my staff if uh, any uh, emergency is there uh, the uh, cci can uh, ngos can help i think panisha ji i think for all of us working in this sector anyway funds is an issue i think during the yeah. pandemic it's going to be a challenge for everybody across the sector of course a uh, lot more things will be required towards emergency relief just the basics health hygiene right and i know that if we'll all work together to make this happen so let me now time is actually uh, there's so many things to discuss in such little time <laughs> so i really don't know what to do but i think the best thing is to get some questions from the audience all right nipul may i uh, add something before the question uh, session yeah, of course yeah i i just wanted to uh, refer to dr shantasinha's uh, uh, remark regarding the grant i think yes it has been a challenge in the past uh, for grant uh, disbursement but you know these have been mainly because of compliances uh, related to documentation which may be uh, incomplete delayed uh, submission and uh, we are uh, uh, in the last uh, couple of years we have really tried to work towards uh, streamlining and ensuring that partners do not um, suffer in the interim period and uh, i think uh, what we are we are uh, definitely um, very empathetic with uh, the entire team salaries issue and we are really looking forward to the revision of the icps uh, i think um, the the required recommendations uh, are um, uh, placed and we hope with the revision uh, in the icps there'll be better remuneration for the teams which would really uh, commensurate with the kind of work and challenges that they encounter in the field so that's something we are really hopeful about thank you i would like to add a point we pull here okay. uh, you know we spoke about uh, you know we discussed just now about icps funding and our funding for the ccis is going down uh, their own uh, not all ccis are funded by the government state government or otherwise there are select uh, selected few who get this funding many of them in fact majority of them you know uh, raise their own funds and run their ccis although they are registered under the juvenile justice act and right now currently these are the organizations who are facing the major major crunch because their donations have drastically dropped and in in some cases it has dropped so much that they are you know even trying to restrict their basic services some of the cci that we work with we have in in all our cases we have stepped up to help them with that but this is something i think in the longer run if we are really you know asking the cci to follow the care and protection and give the best standards of the care i think somewhere even the government needs to come up and uh, look at it however or whatever front fund crunch they have but this is the reality children are there they are registered ccis and uh, fund is always required thank you so I, i think one of the action points maybe for us to discuss offline and take forward is to say how can government and civil society work together to ensure a smooth flow of funds you know even under existing schemes or potentially what else is required because you are absolutely right i think the children are are there uh, they need to be looked after and you are absolutely right that the government's funds don't flow to a large number of ccis at all there are many of them that uh, are not at all getting any funds from the government and from you know 
even outside, if you look at donors or CSR, etc., they have now got so many, their own economic constraints, right? And the fact that there are so many people who will be in, in you know, putting up their hands looking for donations, it's also going to further cramp the flow of funds. So how can we ensure that at least whatever the government can do can be distributed? I think it's a, it's a very important action point and we'll need to work upon it together because I think from a government perspective, their questions is going to be around transparency, right? How do I know that the CCI is working properly? How many children are there? And I think solutions for that are possible. It is possible to get child-wise data which can't be fudged, right? Which, can, which is, represents the reality. It is possible to get outcomes and measure those outcomes and use that as a method of uh, ensuring that the funds are used in the right way. But time is short, so I'm going to move on. Uh, there's a question about, uh, you know, uh, what can be done to look at the, what is the impact on children in the CCIs themselves? Okay, what the schooling may not be possible, right? Uh, they must, you know, they must be under mental health pressure. So what can be done for them? So uh, who would like to start on that? I would like to talk about what we are trying to do at CSA. Uh, Nivedita, I said. No, you go ahead. Yeah. You go ahead. Yeah. I'll yeah. talk later. Uh, so briefly, I mean, we all know from March, the schools are closed. So when the schools were closed, obviously kids are cooped up indoors. Um, no visitors, no donors, no mentors, no volunteers, nobody. And learning was very seriously getting affected as well. Um, recently, uh, the schools have started doing WhatsApp kind of, you know, lessons through WhatsApp and through TV and all of that. But even those are very difficult for our children in CCIs because we have children in multiple age levels and multiple grades. And often there is one phone with the superintendent with one WhatsApp. And many times they don't have the internet connectivity to stream things. So this was actually something that is bothering all our children and what we try to do. Uh, in fact, this was a big eye opener and a learning for ourselves. We actually tried to quickly move into a digital engagement program. Now, we didn't have all our CCIs digitally enabled. So we were able to start with about 25 CCIs. And what we did was we got them quickly digitally enabled with minor tweaks, like wherever routers had to be changed or internet speed has to be picked up. What our team did was actually looked, con looked at content which was available online. So we didn't create anything. We looked at all the content that's available online and speed this time and lots of good content. So we actually borrowed content and we also took the remedial intervention program that was rolled out by the Odisha government. And we found that that was more, more suitable for children from our CCIs. So quickly we created a schedule of what does it look like for say three hours of engagement. So every day there's a bit of a study of math and language. And then we also created uh, recreation activities and my wellness activities. Now these two are very important and you know, uh, children sitting, far away could actually, by getting digitally enabled, could actually do a Zumba session online. We're able to hear, now this picture that you see was actually a guest speaker offering astronomy session where a couple of CCIs together was looped in and they were connected together and the guest speaker spoke about uh, astronomy and then they went on to make some models. So recreation, learning, and my wellness in terms of their yoga online, art and craft, a lot of activities have been happening. Of course, there are huge levels of challenges in terms of connectivity. This here, the picture you can see is actually two homes connected for a joint. Realize that they are actually brother and sister and it happens to be the brother's birthday and the sister happened to wish him. And this we came to know through the session. So we managed to get a lot of such activities. Still a long way to go though because we still have to get a lot of our other homes enabled. But what it actually allowed us to think was the world of opportunities that exist if we are able to invest a little bit in these 
infrastructure and digital uh, uh, facilities that we could actually open it up to children who are in some of the very remote areas and provide uh, tutoring facility, mentoring facility, volunteers could interact with them. So we are actually creating a model of blended learning, which we are going to continue after, hopefully after the COVID as well, because it's just opened our minds on what can be done with these kids without having the issues of, you know, there is, they are far away, they don't get good tutors or they don't have access. I can't physically go there and teach that child, but some of this can actually drastically change. Like how all of us are able to come together on this Zoom conference, which otherwise would have been a great challenge pulling it together. So this is something exciting we are looking forward to. I mean, we are more than happy to learn if others have done and share what we have to make it you know, more enriching for our children. So we're quite excited about this. So sorry, I jumped in. Anyway, Dita, you can. That's OK. Uh, I, the island. I just wanted one clarification. Uh, yeah. Are these for children in the homes or are these for children? I mean, the CCI institutions or are these also for children who have gone back to their families that didn't get clear? Uh, so these are primarily for children in the homes. In the but, home. Yeah, yeah. But with our aftercare children who have gone back and who are not in the homes, we're actually providing them with a smartphone and a spoken English application so, so that they are sitting at home and not doing anything because their courses have been stalled, their jobs are not there. So we've actually used that opportunity to get them skilled during this period. So okay, thanks. thank you for asking that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Shantaji, I will, as part of my second, I will uh, give an answer how we are doing with those children who have gone, gone back to the yes. families. But um, Anandia, I love the idea of connecting one CCI with the other, uh, something uh, innovative. And perhaps I'm going to be repetitive of Anandi as shared just now, because the interventions have been similar. But this was something that we immediately picked up that whatever we need to do with the children with CCI has to be virtual, has to be remote and roped in uh, all the coaching tutors who were outside to connect on Skype or uh, on Zoom to start their classes. We connected with several employees of uh, the corporates who wanted to do fun sessions with the children to keep them connected. Uh, and in many CCIs, there are few kids left, many have gone back. So there is the anxiety level of these children who are in the CCIs is high. Because, and of course, you know, what's happening outside to their parent or relative also is a matter of worry for them. So there's a regular connection now. They speak to their parents once in two days, three days. Uh, you know, there are regular activities to keep the children motivated. But as Anandi pointed out, you know, taking care of their education, the health, particularly mental and the physical health well-being is so important. And we actually wrote in our doctors and, you know, for the remote medical mentoring as such, wherever there are cases that they could really uh, take care of them and talk to them. Uh, we, are, we are, you know, in the process of, you know, providing the technology you know, technology solutions for education, you know, uh, my, through a donor getting the tablets and phones, even those children who are in the CCI are outside so that they are connected. Yes, it's going to be a hybrid education, like Anandi said, in the long run. Uh, so that's how we are, we are looking at it. And the other thing that we are doing with the CCIs is guiding the CCIs really to be in close touch with the DCPUs and CWCs for updating them, you know, taking their um, support, you know, uh, giving the status of the children. Also, they are themselves doing and they are tied up. But some of the Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think there's a problem with my. So then there has to be a close uh, a relationship between the DCPO, CWC, and the CCIs. Although they have it, but this needs to be strengthened so that they are able to, DCPUs are able to monitor the children well. And we are also guiding the CCS to attend the webinars, get guidelines, follow the circular, the circular which Supreme, Honorable Supreme Court came, came up with in March. Uh, we realized that not many CCS had read it, not many CCS had understood it. So we really had to take them through, um, you know, through this. And ma'am, to answer your question about children who have gone home, and we realize that, you know, there is a, there's a lot to be done to A, to make sure that the family and the child stays together. Uh, you know, so therefore, you know, preparing the family to receive the child 
uh, you know, uh, trying to strengthen their family uh, because they are already there's already a resource crunch, you know, already facing unemployment. Uh, there could be, you know, increased cases of vulnerability. So keeping all that in mind, through the CCS, we created a monitoring tool to uh, look after these children or take care of them. Every every once every week, every child and family is connected on phone because currently visits, personal visits are not allowed. On phone, they are connected. And two main things that first thing that the CC has been taught to check is whether the family has enough to eat and whether, whether the family is healthy. These are two things. Mm -hmm. And if there are any issues, then they have to immediately go check with the Gram Panchayat or go to the nearest health center for whatever support that they, that they require. Uh, this also established you know, a close relationship with the family, which earlier is you know, family visit just once in three months or once a month, and the CCS staff is really not so close to the family, and just getting to know them. There are cases of anxiety among the families and the children, and we built in an on-phone remote psychosocial counseling support, which is working extremely well, extremely well. And th that is offered to the, in fact, is ongoing with the children in CCIS as well. But this is something we realized way early in our work in CCIS, that there are many children with emotional issues who require counseling support. And uh, expert counseling support is certainly required. We are, we are, and while we are working with the families, we are also making sure that, you know, that the child is safe. We, we don't want the family or the child to separate and the child to get into any kind of child labor. So that's what we are currently looking at. That is how we are supporting the families. Uh, initially, what we did and which was hats off to my team that within three days of knowing that all these children have gone home and when the report started coming in that they have a finance crunch and there is, isn't it. Within three days, we were able to do a bank transfer to every family. Again, thanks to the government scheme where every family had a bank account. And that came so handy to them to buy their monthly groceries and hygiene items. And we, we, we will continue to do it for, from April for four months till the families are settled. And of course, continue to support that child in the family for further education and anything that they require. But this would be on need basis. Thank you. Uh, that's that's really nice to know, Nivedita, that, you know, once the children are deinstitutionalized, they're put back with their family, there's constant touch and follow up to see what is happening. Because uh, let me tell you, you know, from some uh, sample study that we did, right, across deinstitutionalization, what we found was that there is no contact later on, no follow up visit, no contact. Most CCIs are not geared up, right, to actually do this. This is not part of their, of their mandate or their job, right? And certainly it becomes nobody's job, right, to do that. And therefore, these children just go back into the unknown and are disappeared. They are not visible anymore, right? So it's so very interesting to hear that. Uh, let's, we have time for a few questions. Uh, uh, Vasudha, can you identify a few people have raised their hands? Can you try and get them online? So we Bipur, can... They Bipur, can... Yeah, just add just one bit. Yeah. Uh, i just like to add in addition to the activities which have been shared by um, Anandi and uh, Nivedita. We've also um, organized uh, orientation on psychosocial care for parents and caregivers, which has been done for the entire network. So we hope, you know, that uh, and it's an activity-based uh, manual which has been come up with the help of UNICEF and Protsahan. So uh, the teams uh, have been uh, provided an orientation and uh, we hope, you know, when they do have access to uh, childcare institutions, they'll be able to engage with children in a more uh, constructive and a really fruitful manner. So that's, that's something which we have uh, done it and uh, hope to see it uh, being implemented soon. Yeah, thank you. Very nice. Very nice to hear that. In fact, I think there are many resources many things that many of us are doing. And maybe it's time for us to continue these conversations and the sharing of knowledge and best practices because it's really a very, very problem and we have to put our thinking and our resources in our voices. Yes. Uh, so can we have live questions, please? Yes. 
Arokia, can you hear us? Yes, you may ask your question now. Arokia? So, I think there is connectivity issues. Yeah. In the meanwhile, somebody has asked a question. It's Olivia Nayak. He says, how do you ensure that ECI inmates are safe from abuse? Okay. During the pandemic. And I guess the question is not just during the pandemic, but because in media there are reports now and then about systemic abuse taking place or neglect taking place. So how do you prevent that? Who would like to have Can a I? question? Please. Uh, although I don't have much experience with CCI, except for one or two occasions where we ran our homes, one thing that we did was we had a system of social audit uh, and uh, wherever the home is located, have the community around the home, uh, either the ward member or the panchayat, and couple, one or two parents, and other NGOs, one or two, uh, form a committee where they would hear uh, grievances from the uh, children and also look at other aspects of the home. So, in a sense, social audit. Uh, seems to have worked, uh, especially in times where uh, we know there are some homes that are so vulnerable and there's so much of abuse happening. So insist on greater pro transparency and processes of transparency where children open up and uh, are not further victimized and also hold in camera conversations with children uh, to protect them. So create processes of social audit uh, where there is one outside agency which is from the community and other NGOs who will interact with children and I think this has worked. I'd like to add to that a little more ma'am you said very very rightly that's how but you know making live a culture of child protection is so important. It's not a policy to say just on a you know put in a drawer and forget about it. And this is exactly what we did with our CCIs, helping them to create their child protection policy and then training from their board to their staff to every age appropriate training. Make sure that everybody knows what's, what are those components and how do you report and how do you prevent. This is very important and this I think you know, in every CCI, uh, of course cameras as you said, these are all interventions which are part of it. But bringing that child protection policy live is of highest importance. Thank you. Yeah, if I may just add, uh, so I agree with both of you. So one of the things that we all agree is, you know, it is not enough to have a policy, but again and again, revisit that policy. So personal safety sessions have been done, not just with the children. I think it's more important to do it with the adults in the institution. So they know what are all the rights of the child and how do you protect a child who's under your care and you know in your uh, premises and as man said another thing that has really worked for us is the committee when there when you have children's committee activated and have it actively running if god forbid there is a discomfort or there is something it is bound to come out in those committees so we have to create an environment of safety and security and openness and I think that is critical for all of these forms. I, I, I think that's, uh, you know, that's some very good points. I think it's very important because what I see happening is that what hits the media are some of these incidents. Yeah. Maybe out of 9,000 institutions, there may be a few bad apples, but the uh, name that they give to everybody else, right, is actually very damaging to these to the overall perception around childcare institutions and the work that they do. And therefore, it's really important to be able to not paint all childcare institutions with the same broad brush stroke, but actually say, okay, right, this is where they are, right, in terms of their maturity or in terms of their processes, in terms of their openness, their transparency, their outcomes, and so on and so forth. 
and that way one can actually start to uh, incentivize child and help child care institutions move up in terms of their capabilities uh, through a variety of measures that you know we have, many of us are doing and we, we can all work on so can we have another question i see five participants who have raised their hands yes <laughs> vasudha please select one of them richa can you hear us yeah yeah you yeah. may ask your question thank you thank you so much um, uh, i am richa tyagi from miracle foundation india and uh, 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 Vipul, I had a question for you. You mentioned about uh, a study that you've done, uh, that CSA has done on deinstitutionalization sample study. Uh, just wanted to know about it, if it is available in public domain, and it is, know more about. Yeah, thanks, Richa. It is actually on our website. Okay. Uh, this was a study that we did in Madhya Pradesh. Okay. Um, I think uh, it's. Uh, it was uh, anandi can you do you want to share details on that yeah so uh, we did the study in 2018 19 uh, with solely an objective to understand when children are deinstitutionalized what has been the process and has there been a follow up to children who have gone home and restored back to the family so this was broadly the objective the paper is available on the site but two three things came out of it was that you know the out of a sample size of of course a smaller sample size of 29 children there were only 50% of them have actually had uh, a proper investigation or individual care plan has been developed only for about 15 children about 19 children were counseled and home study was done only for 15 of the 30 children so that's a broadly the data points are there but what's coming out is there's not been enough attention given to the process and preparing for the child to go home and secondly what's also concerning is that there has been no follow up after the child has gone home and there has been no linkages to any funding or any other means of support for the child so we believe that it is really important to restore the child back to the family but what is important is the process that is being followed and after the child is restored how do you monitor the child unless these two aspects are in place you can actually put the child in a really adverse condition to to what was before so that's really the gist of it i mean i would really encourage you to read the paper and it's available on our website thank you another question do we have another question yes hi aditya can you hear us yes yeah you may ask your question yeah so i'm firstly i i am very thankful thankful to all the panelists they have given a brief uh, background and context for the this covid-19 situation and the pandemic how it's impacting on children in need of protection i just have a few question regarding uh, what are the tips uh, for the gatekeeping and promotion of community based services during this pandemic uh, situation and second question is related to after care because this uh, many uh, means as well in our discussion it has mostly focused on institutional care and all but how after care program would be enhanced during pandemic situation because now there are also step uh, stages are coming that the children are now growing up young adults are coming out from the after care and there's a priority as their job skill and their livelihood these all the things are coming out but mostly uh, people are now just focusing on food and grocery but also need to highlight uh, the there's uh, job skill or a hard core skill like that so i want to really uh, i mean know about the uh, this situation i mean how we can support uh, for this to get keeping and after care to come on the community care because uh, i think uh, that's very very important and thank you for asking i'm basing what i'm saying uh, uh, on the experiences of a a couple of ngos that i'm working with and uh, there the gram panchayats have played a phenomenal role what they do is they make a survey of every child 0 to 18 in their constituency and make a care plan for each and every child so if a child has returned as a migrant labor and has gone to school say in delhi and has come back in bihar and uh, is out of sorts then what do i plan for that child or the ch child is at risk of joining a labor force 
what do i do for that or a girl is getting married what do i do for that so they have in in fact uh, if we are, they're tracking about 30000 children in another uh, 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 ngo that i know they're tracking some 45000 children there are huge programs where they do do plan for every child through the gram panchayat and try to resolve uh, locally the issues that uh, that are coming up and what they are not able to resolve they try to link to uh, i mean the gov system but the system is still not ready for them secondly i think when many of these places the local youth have come forward to run children's centers to engage with them you know, many of these parents want to send the children to school, but schools aren't there. Online is also not in those places. So you will find that in the morning for two hours and evening for two hours, the local youth are running, they, they call it remedial classes, but then they're engaging with them in songs, puzzles, dances, some remedial classes also. So there's so much energy in that, in community-based uh, work that is happening on. What I think is important in all this is an area-based approach where they cover every child in that area to see that they are given care and protection. So in a way, every child in that area for them is defined as a child in need of care and protection and they saturate uh, contact with each and every child and make a plan for them. This is something that I thought was phenomenal that is working and that needs to be talked about. That is, that is really amazing and I think if we did that, the whole question, question about vulnerability mapping goes away because mm -hmm. mapping each and every child, right? And making sure that education, all of these needs are being taken care of and there's somebody... Because really when we look at it, you know, what is... People are invisible, right? If they're on the radar, then something can be done, right? Of course, what can be done can be improved, but at least something can be done. But if they're not visible at all, if there's no attention, not even the awareness of that here is a child, right, in need of care and protection, then, then it's like we are shutting our eyes off from those children. So thank you very much for that. I think we have time for another two questions. And then we are going to wrap up. So Vasudha, please. Select Hi, one. Mary. Can you hear us? <laughs> Sangeeta, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can. Can I ask yeah. my question? Yes, yes. Go uh, ahead. Yeah. Thank you for these informative presentations. I had two points. Uh, while I think Manisha, ma'am, uh, did mention that there were protocols, uh, We've not seen the implementation of these protocols, especially for uh, those adolescents facing sexual abuse under 18 for Mumbai, uh, where Sehat, my organization, works very closely with the Bombay Municipal Corporation. We had a huge uh, challenge as far as admission of children was concerned. There was a mandatory COVID test that was required. We all know that unless there are symptomatic patients, it cannot be done. Uh, unfortunately, nobody from the child welfare committees in Mumbai were able to even direct uh, admissions for these three young girls, you know, all under uh, 18, pregnant and uh, almost 30 weeks and they could not be kept in the hospital, which is usually what happens in non-COVID times till uh, such a time that they deliver. So my challenge is, how does one bring the child welfare committees on the same page to be able to understand the relevance of when and why COVID tests can, cannot be done. What are the facilities available for quarantining? Uh, you know, it can't be an escalation every time. And uh, so the protocols may be there. Uh, they are definitely not available on the WCD websites. They are definitely not populated. And so I'm coming from that perspective that if we can get some guidance, then we can use it to say that these are the protocols. We translate them, you know, there's a training uh, for the people at the level of the shelters. So, also the second issue being, I know that this is a different forum, but I also would like to draw your attention to the move by the ministry to increase age at marriage. I recall the child line presentation looking at the large number of, uh, you know, children that were rescued uh, to prevent child marriages. And now there's an entire headway to move it to 21. 
uh, you know, and we could share a submission that's being uh, put together by the PLD and about 30 odd organizations from across the country. And I feel like we need to allude to that conversation as well. Thank you. Is there anybody who'd like to take it up? Manisha ji. Yeah, yeah, I am here. Uh, actually, uh, for uh, quarantine, we are uh, guided uh, every district officer to keep a uh, uh, CCI uh, observation home and a SA uh, for this um, quarantine facility. And uh, we are given this guidance uh, to all the district uh, officer. And ma'am, uh, thank you, ma'am. If you have a problem to uh, any particular district, you can uh, ask us. Uh, you can uh, call me, and I will uh, try to solve the problem. Because I don't think that, uh, uh, and every CWC is aware of this thing, and so uh, CWCs uh, must uh, attend your case. But if uh, this problem arises, you please uh, contact me uh, directly. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we have time for one more question. Hi, Neha. Can you hear us? Neha? Hello? Yeah, yes. go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, myself, Neha Singh, I, I stay in Mumbai and basically all panelists have given such a great view and thank you for uh, inviting us in this, like giving us a uh, opportunity to listen all uh, speakers. My question is basically that uh, we are blaming game each other uh, system of government and uh, like uh, these people are not doing or those not not doing the work but we all should come together and try to uh, make some role models that uh, who can help each other basically like cwc are uh, facing problem yeah in mumbai cwcs are not doing some one or two cwc panelists are not doing work other are doing it but let's uh, we should uh, explain them and we should give training and we should try to what what face means in uh, what we are facing issues we should give them higher authority writing that huh, your panelists of CWC is not working proper. So we should try to solve. The sound is gone. But I think we have taken our point that we should all work together. Yeah, that's right. So on this note, I'm actually going to try and sum up some of the discussions that we have had. And uh, of course, the panelists can give their uh, concluding comments. So to me, you know, I think, uh, I think the need for us to work together is very, very much there. They are wonderful. You know, the scale of the problem is huge. There are some wonderful examples that different organizations have done, which have worked. Uh, so I think, do think we need to create some forum by which we can continue to share. Uh, I think in today's discussion, there were three topics that I felt uh, emerged as being really important. One is around the mapping of vulnerable kids, children and seeing how can we care for them. Clearly under the COVID crisis, the impact on these children, which is anyway, they are very fragile. I think the impact will be much more. We can see that from the data that's already emerging from child lying. Uh, and we really, you know, don't have a great system of being able to identify uh, them, right? And work with them. I think there are some great examples. There are some interesting things that can be taken forward involving the community, as Shantaji said, that's really a wonderful, wonderful effort. Uh, vulnerability mapping, frontline workers. So I think that's one area that probably we all need to think about and work towards. The second, which I think uh, is going to be really important to continue to serve these children, right? is really going to be about funding. Um, and uh, to make sure that funds are available from the government, uh, 
uh, from civil society and to how to streamline the flow of funds uh, under various schemes to the beneficiary. And maybe that's another area that we can uh, think a little further about from both ends, right? What, what are the constraints or what's the perspective of the government in releasing funds? And, and of course, how do we uh, identify those that require funds? Some of them may be not be registered, but still require, the, require funds. And the third is, I think there are around both CCIs and alternative care, right? These are the mainstay of rehabilitation. And around these, the best practices that have worked, right? That are, have been implemented in pockets uh, by different uh, institutions working in this space. I think maybe these need to be brought out shared as learnings and found a way to disseminate them uh, to across the network of uh, 9,000 institutions that exist in the country. I would again like to say that the 9,000 institutions that exist are a phenomenal infrastructure available. These are all led by people who have very, very good intentions at heart, they are working, there already are children existing there. If we can strengthen these institutions and we can empower them uh, in the law to continue to provide these services, I think we'll have uh, done a great service to, uh, to the children. And of course, while alternative care and rehabilitation of the uh, family is required, but I think you will still need institutions to be there. And therefore, how do we up their level? How do we increase transparency? How do we make sure that issues of child abuse and, and, uh, and neglect are not there or they are quickly identified and those institutions are shut down, but the rest of the sector get their due. They're not considered places of last resort. They're not considered places uh, of, and viewed with suspicion, but actually with encouragement to provide the very, very essential services that they are providing. So I, I think uh, these are my uh, concluding comments. <clears throat> I would like to ask each of the panelists to, to add to this before we close, uh, bring a close, this session to a close. I'll add just a continuation to what you have said. I, I'm wondering, after li listening to you, if the CCIs can become training and nodal centers uh, for telling others uh, uh, in the community uh, what child care is about, what child protection is about, and expand the role of the CCI, uh, you know, to become training and resource centers where people come to you in an exposure visit to see how to do take care of children? How do we democratize institutions? If children's committees are formed, show them that this is what it is. So I'm just wondering uh, whether we redefine child care institutions. Now it, is, it seems it is in isolation, but the 9,000 institutions should support some 90,000 other uh, uh, institutions in child care and protection, is that possible? And I would like to end on this note that thank you for this energy that you've given me. And I'm sure that we can expand our protection of uh, children's care through the wonderful work each one of you is doing. Thank you. Thank you, Shantaji. Any other closing comments? Yeah, I would like to uh, come in here. Uh, thank you, uh, Vipul and CSA, for this wonderful opportunity. And it is really a good brainstorming session with so many uh, uh, experiments and uh, so it's so much happening has been shared. As concluding, I, I would say that, you know, it is going to be, I think it is the way, as you said, Vipul, is there has to be a collective way of solving, looking at this. Working in silos is not really going to work. The government, the civil society, the child right activists, everybody needs to come together and um, you know, find solutions and share with each other what are the best practices. 
as you said okay there's so much work being done in pockets that needs to all come together um second is you know the rapid and large scale expansion of the social protection system is really required at this stage because it's there we do know it but it has to be really active and easily accessible to families uh, our experience is that families really do not have knowledge about this and that requires to be you know spread across uh, also ensuring and all of us agree that you know child has a family and that is of highest importance because families do exist they need support i we understand that and if we support them guide them link them up with the existing schemes and resources they can look after their children uh, i do understand what people say there is going to be a need for ccs for children in transition for a temporary period it will continue because a country is vast and there are so many problems that the children face i think the core child protection services and the service providers and authorities really need to be they are but i think they need to be more active and upfront uh, working on this particularly with the pandemic and beyond that because we are in this for a long run now it's not going to system there has to be a proper system of reporting of violence it has to be further strengthened chilling is doing a great job but getting down to the village and other ccl level of villages is required so those are my things and i think what at, at this stage i would say is the believing in the work of civil societies on ground is really crucial government does recognize it in some places i do feel that you know the work of the civil societies need more recognition and at the last and whatever we are all doing and we continue to do is in the best interest of the child is not because miracle foundation wants or somebody else wants or the government system wants at the core of it is the child and that's what we are all striving so that the child is cared for and is safe thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity thank you thank you mary anybody so vipul yeah i'd like to share a few things i think thank you for this wonderful opportunity because it has brought uh, on one platform very critical reflections and insights into the functioning and how we could better the situation for children i think while there are um, state government centrally sponsored schemes which are being uh, mooted there is a need for increased awareness about the existence of these schemes because unless people are aware they would not be able to access it and linkages to be established convergence i think is the key which has been already uh, emphasized by uh, all the speakers and uh, convergence would would have to be bottom up right from the district village uh, to you know the state and the national because that commitment has to be consistent across uh, then we could really see some uh, definite and concrete change i think also for um, it's uh, every child is everyone's responsibility is what it is the motto i think if we do believe and uh, practice it so um, being vigilance and uh, while we say about community uh, vigilance uh, you know ensuring through vulnerability mapping ensuring the systems work each one of us uh, should be an ambassador and a vigilant for reporting uh, uh, violations when we see it and of course uh, uh, information and awareness about child line to be to reach the last mile we are trying it through our uh, child line models where we have the sub centers also which reach the remotest blocks but i think uh, it's it's a limited team and uh, like we said community participation is is the key to make sure that uh, we can get to every child also some of the issues which we have seen about um, uh, that child marriage child labor uh, whether there is whether there is a need to see if we could increase the age of compulsory education you know maybe up to 50, up to 18 at the moment it's 14 but that would definitely that is also one of the factors where ch children drop out they drop out for financial reasons constraints of the family but also um, i think Uh, if, if this is an issue if it can be looked at may help to promote uh, you know continued education for uh, children and especially girls when you look at in the remote um, areas rural uh, areas districts uh, of the country uh, this is certainly uh, will promote uh, the concept of ensuring that a girl child continues her education so uh, also 
vulnerability mapping is already stressed so i think uh, most of the points have been covered thank you very much it's been a great engaging conversation and a great learning thank you uh, thank you i'm i'm uh, echoing must must already said most of the thoughts the similar ones it's been a great conversation um i think all of us have to be in this collective work that we do whether it is prevention whether it's protecting the kids in in the homes and supporting the family i'm only also a little anxious about what this whole covid is going to change how the landscape of you know the children and the number of children is going to change beyond this so we all have to be prepared to face the change changing landscape and i'm sure all of us are doing our bit and together we are we can achieve much more so it's been great talking to all of you thank you so much okay manisha ji any last uh, words <laughs> okay uh, so i'm going to now um, bring this uh, webinar to a close i'd like to thank all of you all the participants all the panelists we have received a lot of questions i think it's 58 questions as i can see at the bottom of my screen uh what we'll try and do is this session we will take these uh, questions we'll try and see if they're directed towards any particular panelist or to all of us and we'll send them out to the panelists and i request the panelists to respond back to the people who have answered these questions uh there is also going to be a poll that will be uh, put online uh, which is basically feedback around the session uh so i would request all of you to please give your feedback right that will enable us to think about uh, you know what we should do in future and how do we continue to engage with each other So on that note thank you very much thank you it's been a wonderful and uh, yeah it's been a pleasure to host such a wonderful conversation thank you